Hello, 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 hello from Montreal, Canada. And here they say bonjour. That is the only French I know. So welcome to uh, my YouTube channel for this week. And I am hosting some people that I've wanted for, to host for a very long time. So uh, when I found Brave, I was like, I have to, I have to, I have to host him while we are still here in Montreal, where I have been attending the International AIDS Conference hosted by the International AIDS Society and uh, this year's theme was re-engage and follow the science. My YouTube channel, Rave Derazi. I hope I have said your name the right way. Yes, you have. Thank you so much, and thank you for doing this with me. This is really great. Thank you so much, Rave. And I would want you to introduce yourself to us and to the people who do not know about you. So yeah, my name is Rave Derazi. I live in Los Angeles, California, in the States. Um, I was diagnosed with AIDS in 2012. Um, shortly after, it became undetectable, and really, it was a steep learning curve how far we've come with HIV. I thought I was going to be dead in two to three years. <laughs> Right, what, a, what a joke. I know. Um, and, and the first place I turned to was social media yeah. to try to find people who look like me, who look like us, who I could relate to, that, who were healthy and living with HIV, and I didn't see it. So I knew that that's something that I wanted to do. And so since then, I've been on social media, and I show that I'm a, a bodybuilder training as well, that you can do things like that with your body. Um, so, yeah. And uh, Riff, I want to ask you about the issues that, as a person living with HIV, what is the first challenge that you like experienced during your diagnosis, like the early mm. times of diagnosis? I would say the very first challenge that I had was just learning what my possibilities for my life were mm -hmm. living with HIV, that I wasn't going to die. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. That was the number one thing that I had to get over in the very beginning. And I think a lot of people can relate to that. Yeah. Because even though we know about all the the adverse, you know, what happens to us when we get HIV, we don't learn what happens after that. It's all, all prevention. Don't get HIV, use a condom, you know, be, have safer sex, but no one says, but if you get HIV, you can live a long, healthy, happy, thriving life. Very, very true. And uh, I come from a country where people living with HIV are highly stigmatized. Like, living with HIV needs to be a secret. You are secret, not anybody else's. Nobody should know that you have HIV. And for my viewers, what, what country are you? Uh, oh, sorry, uh, I, I come from Kenya. I come from Kenya. And uh, from that, basically, it's, it's like, you need to keep quiet and not disclose your status publicly. So I personally live with HIV publicly, and I've lived with HIV for almost 30 years now. So I would like to know the, the stigma perspective from the US. Yeah, um, you know, it's it's very definitely in the U.S. U.S. is such a large country. You can go to rural areas or more metropolitan areas and it's going to be vastly different. My personal experience living in L.A., which is very progressive and there's lots of education around HIV and safer sex, yeah. um, has been pretty good for, for the most part. However, there are certain instances where I'm like, I'm kind of shocked the lack of education still in, in 2020, 2022. Yeah. I had an instance with my barber um, a few years ago where he stopped talking to me once he learned that I had HIV. He wouldn't respond to any of my texts, my calls. And I'd been seeing him every single week, so it wasn't like we had just a, a basic relationship. It was, we were getting pretty close. And I had to find a new barber, and then at that barber shop, someone who has seen me on, on social media, they were concerned that my barber was using the same tools on my hair that they were on his hair, and that there might be transmission risk there. Yeah. And, and that is so, so crazy. Like, I, yeah. I don't expect that to happen yeah. in the U.S. <laughs> like, I mean... <laughs> in the 80s, maybe, people were afraid yeah. to go in the same pool. Yeah, but, but, but no? right now, honestly, I do not expect that, like, a baba can ghost you, you know, for that. Yeah, and it's, it's certainly really, not legal. Yeah, I, I know. It's, but let me tell you one thing about the law and living with HIV. Mm. On paper, the law is very beautiful. On paper, the law protects us as people living with HIV, but in real life, it's um, it's hard. You can tell somebody, I know my right, I am protected by them, because it's it's more of a mind thing, because it is the mind that is telling them, hey, 
I, I don't want to serve you. I don't care what the law says. I don't want to serve you. And we have very many countries where the laws protect people living with HIV, but in real life, the reality setup is just. It's, it's not it. Because those are the social, cultural norms. Exactly. So I want to ask you a question that is something that bothers most people living with HIV, and that is the aspect of dating. How has it been for you? <laughs> you know, for me, it's a little different, I think, because I was so open and, and honest and confident in my, my status. Yeah. So, although I didn't put it on my profiles, as soon as we started to have the conversation, I would let people know. Um, I would also wait sometimes until the first date because I figure at that point, you know, you've kind of committed to this person. You're out somewhere in public. Yeah, yeah. It's like I've trapped you in this space. And uh, it also gives me an opportunity to educate them. And they can't just like block me and say, you know, right here so we can talk. And I would say most of the time after we have a discussion about it, um, it's a positive reaction. Whether they decide they want to keep dating, um, at, least, at the very least, they're like, oh, I learned something I didn't know. That's but good. but what about, because most people living with HIV, let's face it, they are really struggling to yeah. find relationships and also disclose the HIV data. So talk to us a little bit about the disclosure perspective. Yeah, so that's a tricky question because as advocates, of course we want to say everyone should disclose, it's so important. We need visibility and role models. But it's a sensitive topic because for some people it's it's really there's a real danger there if they were to disclose that other people can use that information maliciously. Exactly. If you live in a small town and and everybody knows everybody, if one person finds out because you told them and they decide to tell the whole town, there's no going back. There's irreparable damage that can happen there and for sex workers and things like that. So I personally tell people, you know, it's a personal, it's a very personal decision. If you are in a situation where it's safe for you to do so, I encourage you to. Um, especially if it's someone who you might end up having a relationship with. But otherwise, it's, yeah, it's a personal decision. It's a personal decision. Uh, and I want It should not be the law. <laughs> So, okay, you, you know, the thing is, sometimes I feel like um, as advocates, we make living with HIV easy, but uh, in real life settings, because of the stigma and the discrimination, a lot of people are like, you. it's like we as advocates are from the privileged side of things, and uh, the rest of the population of people living with HIV are like, um, if I if I disclose, like maybe there are friendly countries, there are places where you can even be banned from a, your own community. So that becomes a little bit hard. And I don't know how if you would like, like to answer the question or not. But um, your family members, do they all know that you're living in Egypt? Yes. However, when I decided I wanted to start speaking about it on social media, yeah. I had just I had just reconnected with my biological father's side of the family, the yeah. Moroccan. Mm -hmm. I just established a relationship and at the same time I said, you know, I want to start talking about this on social media. Well, this half-brother that I just found out about reached out and said, if you go on YouTube and talk about your status, the whole family will disown you and they will no longer acknowledge that you are related to us. And so it took me time to, to, de to decide that that's what I wanted to do, but at the end of the day no one's going to tell me what I can do. Very true, and uh, as a person who has been, uh, faced uh, HIV-related stigma from my own family members, I actually do understand it because I don't. Some of them I don't even talk to them because I'm like, you know, at the end of the day, I'm the one living in the HIV, not them. So let everybody live their life. So in a sense, yes, we have the privilege, but we've also, from the very beginning, set the standard. Mm -hmm. This is how we are going to be treated. Yeah. If you don't accept that, then you are not part of our lives. Exactly. So as a result of that, now we have created an environment where it's safe and supportive. And, and I love that, that uh, and it's something I always tell most people who follow me on my social media platforms, that uh, there's something I said and it was featured on TV this week, that believe in yourself like you are a religion. Like believe in yourself. It's it's not about the other people. They don't take treatment. You do. They don't live this life with HIV. You do. They're not striving to be indetectable. You are. So at the end of the day, the person who goes to bed at night is you. You so are your number one advocate. You are your number one advocate. It doesn't matter. Forget the rest of the... Because I see a lot of people coming to me and they're like, I, you know, I'm living with HIV too. I've accepted my status, but I can't live with it publicly. I'm like, it's about you. Yes. It is about you. Because when I started talking publicly, like my, my family members are like, 
No, why can't she just take her treatment and be quiet? Like, what does she like, have to gain? You know, he said, but it is my life. Mind your business. Mind Stay you? in your lane. Exactly. I'm the, I'm the one who has been on treatment for 17 years. How long have you been on treatment? All right. How long have oh, you been? Oh, me? Um, since 2012, so 10 years. 10 years. Uh -huh. So, and uh, it, as we are talking about treatment, how easy is the access to treatment here in uh, in the US or we're in Canada in the US? In incredibly easy. Yeah. Incredibly yeah. Easy. From easy. all income levels, no matter what, you can access treatment. Are air the problem free? is people don't know that. Are air risk free in, in America? Yes. They are free? Yes. They can yeah, if you're below a certain income level, uh -huh. you can get a free Oh it's it's all about the your income level. Mm -hmm. uh, Otherwise you can have insurance and then it goes through insurance completely covered by insurance. The problem is people don't know, and B, um, people are afraid to access it because of confidentiality. They're afraid that they'll be outed. Yeah, I get that, and uh, it's, uh, the issue of access, I think it's like a global issue, mm -hmm. where most people really have the challenge of accessing treatment as much as they they w they want the treatment, but then they're like, um, if I go and access treatment, what is going to happen to me? Especially yeah. in, like for example, people who come to foreign countries and they live in HIV, they really do have an issue in terms of access to treatment. And even people who are natives of the country, they still have an issue with that. So It's, it's fortunate for me because I live in a, in a city, mm -hmm. so I have my medicine delivered to my home Wow. in a, <laughs> in a blank package so you never know what it is. If yeah. you shake it you hear pills. Yeah. That's all you know. <laughs> which which uh, regimen are you on? I'm taking Big Tarby. When I grew up I want to be switched to Big Tarby. Big Tarby is not available in my country. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we on the I'm on the TLD the channel for Bill Namovida and Dulu Tebrave. Mm -hmm. So I am not taking um, Big Tarby. Is that multiple pills or is it's, it it's it's a multiple pill. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, it's a single pill that it's three in one. So I don't know is Big Tarby It's three in one two. Three in one two. Uh, okay. So I want you to talk to us a little bit about you equals you yeah. as a campaign. Do you think that it can end stigma related to each other? It can get us close. It can get, it can get us very close. I, you know, there's always going to be some people who are working against what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, extremely religious people, people who are just negative and just have, are always going to have discrimination about yeah. no matter what. Mm -hmm. But it can certainly get us very close to mass acceptance of you equals you. I think having countries endorse you equals you is very important. I know Canada was a lot earlier on to do that. The US kind of lagged behind and so people were kind of skeptical even when the CDC said you know you equals you is valid. Um, so yeah. And uh, now we are coming towards the very end of this uh, YouTube discussion and I want to ask you about uh, when I was first diagnosed we were told I was Back then, we used to be given like a whole nutrition chart, you taken through nutritional counseling, I told you should work out, uh, eat well, and all that. So I want you to talk a little bit about the fitness part of living with HIV, because a lot of people living with HIV have complained, especially on TLD, the weight gain there is massive. I can tell you that I have struggled, but how, how can you encourage somebody who is especially struggling with the weight gain as a side effect of air beast to embrace fitness in their lives. Yeah, fitness is a whole, fitness can be a whole discussion. Yeah. <laughs> so, I know, I know. <laughs> but I, you know, it's going to be different for everyone too. Mm -hmm. For me, I know that people have access to different things related to fitness, mm -hmm. depending on where they live, um, socioeconomic status. So mm -hmm. it's very dependent on what do you enjoy doing that's physical. Mm -hmm. It could be going in nature, it could be swimming in a pool mm -hmm. or in a lake or it can be going to a gym if you have access to a gym. But finding that thing that you love to do, make that your time. It's, again, you have to be your own advocate. It's your religion. So fitness has to become part of your religion, your routine. And the most important thing you can do is consistency. It's not about going for two hours as hard as you can, and then the next day you're like, I'm done for the month. Like, give me a burger and fries, right? I'm out. No, you wanna like go easy. Mm -hmm. and it's all about showing up. Mm -hmm. Even if you do a little bit, mm -hmm. as long as you're consistent, yeah. that's what matters. And then you pair that with good eating, nutrition. Again, it's about loving yourself. Mm -hmm. Your body's your temple. Mm -hmm. So you wanna treat it as such. It's the temple for your religion. Exactly. So um, pairing nutrition, eating right, hydration is overlooked often, yeah, very and getting enough sleep, and anxiety, anxiety is a huge one, it's our mental health, because mm -hmm. that affects our, 
how well our body functions. Mm -hmm. If we have a lot of anxiety, depression, stress, then we're going to hold on to fat, mm -hmm. and we're going to hold on to the water weight. So, and so what I say is, a lot of people come to me and they say that the drugs make them gain weight. Mm -hmm. the, there might be some truth to that, but it might also be we're aging, mm -hmm. and yeah, our yeah, lifestyle, yeah. and our nutrition, and all of those things. Mm -hmm. So take control of what you have. Don't be a victim. Don't give all the power over to your ARVs. Take control of what you have power over and go with that. Thank you so much for saying that. And I always tell people, you don't exactly need to be like a routine, lifting weight, or doing all the hard work. It can just be a one hour walk. Uh -huh. And that is just enough. At least it, it the, the body has done a little bit of uh, movement yes, and that is what rate. exactly and that is what the body needs because at the end of the day our lifestyles actually do affect us from one uh, one way or another and the air is just maybe like a spike into them but it's a whole holistic yeah. thing and um, I really want to appreciate you for coming to my YouTube channel and you for too. also <laughs> for also sharing like i've waited for this moment for a very very long time <laughs> so thank you so much for this and uh continue doing the amazing work that you're doing we're gonna it, have more discussions we definitely have to have more discussion we definitely have to have more discussions about this because one thing about hiv and it has even come out of this conference is until we start having no more intentional conversations yes. around hiv until we normalize the hiv conversation yeah. We are not going anywhere. 40 years from now, we are still going to be talking about HIV related stigma and we will not end there. So I wanted to send a message to somebody uh, who has watched us today and just tell them one point. They are struggling with the theories, with acceptance, with just figuring out life as a person living with HIV. Just tell them something. First thing is to start with you, yourself. When you are alone in a room, that you love yourself, that you accept yourself, you're kind to yourself, be kind. We're so hard on ourselves. And as hard as we are on everyone else, we are, that's the way we treat ourselves. So be conscious of the thoughts that you, you say to yourself without even thinking, oh, I'm a horrible person, oh, I'm fat, oh, I'm ugly, oh, I'm sick, no one wants me, no one's gonna love me, all those things. And you have to start rewriting that every day. Write down things that you're grateful for. Write down positive affirmations that you can repeat to yourself when you're feeling a certain way yeah. and it has to start from the inside that's thank the key to everything else it has to start from the inside thank you so much uh and uh i want to just reiterate what Frank just told us be kind to yourself always and i always tell you it's about you it's not about anybody else you are the one living this journey you are the one walking this journey so follow us on social media and continue supporting the work that we do in terms of educating people in the HIV response. Thank you so much for coming. I truly appreciate it. Bye guys.